pressure looks good. Tom, right now. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's NSF Live, our weekly show where we talk about all things spaceflight and answer your questions about the topics that happened recently. This week we have some upcoming debut launchers, a crew launch and as always our big starship, starship my god, section at the end. My name is Adrian Bile. I'm a writer and commentator for NSF and with me today our assistant managing editor for NSF, Chris Gebhardt. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself, Adrian? I am doing perfect. I'm really excited for for this night because with with the crew launch coming up later, it's going to be one interesting night for sure. Uh, and also with us today, it's a writer and commentator and a lot of other things, Alejandro Alcantaria Romera. Alex, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. I saw you try there with my name. Uh, I'm not going to be asking people to perfectly pronounce it, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Really excited for this upcoming week of, of you know, activity with, with three launches potentially tomorrow and all of the stuff that we have to talk about today as well. Yes, for sure. We will dive right into it because we have a lot of topics today we want to talk about. And as always, make sure to tag at NASA Spaceflight in chat for your questions. Uh, we will answer the questions that are related to the topics we are just discussing. So, for example, if you have a Starship question, maybe hold on to that. Uh, until we are coming to the Starship section. So let's start with the topics we have today. And the beginning of this week started with an acquisition. Vast has acquired Launcher. Chris G, you want to give us an overview about that? Yeah, so if you remember uh, one of our polls at the beginning of the year, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, right, Adrian, was uh, what what were some of the major takeovers or buyouts or acquisitions that we were expecting in the industry, and this is probably an example of one of the, the the smaller but potentially really consequential acquisitions. So, um, Vast was a company that was only founded last year in 2022 with an aim of building an artificial gravity research station as well as free flying modular zero gravity space stations in low Earth orbit. And the specific idea behind their artificial gravity station was that it was going to be 100 meters or 333 feet long. And at the ends of it, as it spun, it was going to provide Earth le sea level gravity. And then as you worked your way in toward the center, you would eventually arrive at Mars gravity and then lunar gravity. So it would serve as a test bed for multiple different, um, multiple different potential destinations in the solar system, but also as a, an important test bed for how that how artificial gravity now affects the human body, right? Because we're we're understanding through the International Space Station how microgravity affects the human body, but what about artificial gravity? You know, we haven't really studied that. So that would be an important part of that. So as part of this overall plan to do that, VAST was looking to do that as quickly as possible and acquire the talent that they really needed. And they looked at Launcher and saw a lot of that, um, a lot of that talent there. And so they approached Launcher and acquired them and bought them out. And right now the plan for the company, which is vast, is that they will take Launcher's orbiter vehicles that were under development and they'll continue to use them to test the, the technology that they need for their artificial gravity space station, as well as other space tug technology customers, or, or, as well as other space tug technology and space tug customers uh, that are out there. Uh, development very critically on the E2 engine will also continue. However, the launch vehicle that Launcher was planning will not continue now under the new, uh, under the new act position by VAST. However, the CEO of Launcher, Max, will become the president of VAST. So there is good synergy there. And the, the press release specifically noted that the employees of Launcher are now employees of VAST. They didn't actually note any layoffs, but just that the team expanded to include everyone, basically. Um, that, that's what the release says. I can't speak to the firm reality of that, but at least it, it, it sort of signifies a, a synergistic coming together of these two companies rather than a, um, oh, you're doing what we're doing, so we're going to buy you so you can't do that anymore. And, and I think that's a really important element, which is why I think this could be a very smaller scale acquisition that could really have a large scale payoff here. 
Yeah, it, it really feels like they, uh, this orbital tug technology, they really wanted that. I mean, uh, have they indicated at all if what launcher they might use in the future for, for the upcoming missions, uh, since they, they will not use this? Uh, they they have not uh, entirely uh, said, said just that that just yet, and not surprising given where they are in the early stages of development for that space station. You kind of need to have a little bit more. I mean, like the renders look cool and everything, but you yeah. really need to have an idea of what the station is actually going to be built with, how many modules is it going to be, uh, what type of construction and outfitting might you be using, um, even though a lot of that can be automated now, because a lot of stuff that used to be, that we used to have to put outside the International Space Station because it was so big can now go inside. The Axiom module additions to the ISS are a good example of that. Um, so once you sort of have all of that, then you can look at, okay, what are the vehicles that are available that could do that um, based on how big they sort of want this thing to be a couple of options really jump to mind uh, starship new glenn and vulcan are distinct possibilities for the launch vehicle for for this station um, and its various components it's also uh, indicating how far this might be out with the just named rockets because none of these three rockets so far has flown. So uh, there's also two <laughs> likely will this year within months of each within a couple months of each other. So yes. Yes, it's uh <laughs> it's definitely an interesting choice. Uh but it also shows how much movement there is on the launch market as well. So now the other uh, thing I would say too with, with, with the station is don't also discount the possibility of inflatable technology um and inflatable modules which have been tested on the iss and in pre-flight orbit with genesis uh, with well beam on the iss and genesis one and genesis two in orbit then uh let's hope they I, I really think this is one of the good acquisitions because it doesn't feel like one of the acquisitions that some people would feared i think right now in space which is more like companies buying companies that are in financial trouble this feels more as like a acquisition where they just made like they thought it made sense, so they went with it. But this wasn't like, oh, they're struggling. Let's just uh, take them in. So this, this feels more like a good acquisition to me and not of the ones that are more consolidation of this, of markets and segments. So I, I like that. I have uh, two questions here. One is uh, more general. Uh, why do we say microgravity for the ISS instead of zero, zero G? Ah, because it is not zero G. Uh, there is, so you are essentially weightless essentially you are so close to zero gravity that you could call it that but in in the true scientific sense earth's gravity is still tugging on the iss the sun's gravity is still tugging on the iss the moon's gravity is tugging on it i mean heck even mars jupiter saturn will, will all tug on, on it in, in in various ways with n body um physics so it's it's close enough for the scientific purposes that we need, but it's not truly, so we call it microgravity. There we go. So like basically difference are very little, but it's, it's a technical difference. In mm. Which makes it... all the difference in science experiments, yes. There we go. And the... also, okay. uh, I think, I'm gonna reference shuttle here, by the way. Uh, I think even the direction in which your station is oriented at some points uh, is affecting that as well because the basically yes. gravity changes along the radial basically from from bottom to top in that direction it doesn't it it changes a little bit but it doesn't change as much on the other direction basically uh, horizontally to the ground and so yes. I think on some shuttle missions they had the shuttle oriented in some orientation precisely so that the experiments wouldn't notice as much variations of gravity along its orbit. And I think that is also true. called a gravity gradient orbit. You basically exactly. aimed the engines down. It was engines down at the ground. And that's how you, and you imparted, I think it's a 1.4 degree per minute rotation is what you need um, to maintain that orientation as you orbit the earth every 90 mm -hmm. minutes or so. And yes, that is the exact orientation and reason they would get into yeah. that for some of the biological uh, experiments, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> the shuttle reference bingo card. You can all mark that on your on your board. Um, we have another question by Christian here. Uh, what orbit will they use for? Uh, do they already uh, said that about their uh, their potential like station? Which orbit they will do? No, and perhaps a bit premature for that one. Um, but it's going to depend on 
the, the launch vehicle you eventually choose, the number of modules or number of launches you need, um, and also what you're trying to do with that station. Because if you, if you let's, we'll just use Kennedy Space Center as, as, as the reference. If you launch from there, right, the most efficient orbit to get into is 28 and a half degrees because that's the latitude of the launch site. So that's the easiest, but if you go to that orbit, you can't see the poles. So if you're trying to entice customers in a wide variety of scientific, you know, to leverage the station in scientific observations of Earth, you would probably want a higher inclination orbit, 57, which is achievable from the Cape, also the polar orbits, because Jack's not here. Uh, so I'll mention them now uh, <laughs> from the Cape. Um, so it just sort of comes down to what you what you want the overall business case for the station to be, because you can you can mimic Mars, Earth, and lunar gravity by spinning the station, and inclination doesn't play into that. Certainly an interesting topic, and I'm really curious how how this all will develop, because I feel like this artificial gravity topic is something that always comes up a lot, especially in a bit more down the line scenarios, for example, for Mars travel. So it's really interesting to see how they will yeah, test that out. Now a question here about the ISS, which is a related topic, I guess, here, which all come up of quite a lot today. Uh, when will the ISS actually retire? Uh, is there already a timeline for that? Right now, 2023 uh, is to, is the date that the international partners have agreed at this point to fund the International Space Station out to. Um, there is a lot of thought that that would be it and that that will be the end and will retire the ISS at that point. Um, the plan, though, however, is that in, in the interim, six years, Axiom will add... Is that 2023 uh, or 2028? Well, wait. I think you said what? 2023. Probably a, a, a miss. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, the, uh, well, the ISS out to 2030. Sorry. If yeah. I said 2023, totally misspoke there. ISS out to 2030. <laughs> there we go. Let's Probably go for the, the best to get that date right. Um, yes, ISS out to 2030 is about the end of, uh, uh, of, of what is currently planned through funding and agreements with the international partners. That can, of course, be extended because it used to be 2016, then it was 2020, then it was 2024, now it's 20. 30. Um, however, Axiom's plan over the next um, uh, uh, seven to six years is to add a series of modular complexes to the ISS. And then at the end of the ISS's life, those modules can be detached and become free flying on their own. And basically means no gap in low Earth orbit space station capabilities at the end of the ISS's lifetime in 2030. <laughs> we go. <laughs> and you thought you could just get a, a simple year answer here, but it's a complicated as always. Um, it's always. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's never just an easy, easy answer in space. Uh, last question here on this topic before we move on, because I said we have a lot of topics today. Um, you said engine development would continue. Uh, what applications are they looking at for that now? Uh, so since they are no longer building a rocket. So why would they possibly continue engine development? Uh, the in-space tugs are a lot of what they're looking at here and, and in-space propulsion. So um, the, that that's the development process. There we go. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next topic here, which is one, let me just click, yes. This is one uh, that a quite, I, I, I think quite a few people are, I'm waiting for this um, <laughs> since uh, it's an upcoming rocket launcher, which is Relativity with their Terran 1, which dropped an announcement video uh, about their possible first flight date of their methane powered rocket, which is March 8th, not that far away. It's a three hour launch window starting at 1 p.m. EST, and they will launch from uh, Slick 16 at Cape Canaveral. So, yeah, we are really getting into the methane methane time of, of launches here with Terran 1 probably starting that se that season. And uh, yeah, any thoughts on that, guys? Well, I was, I was gonna say, this is an interesting one, right? Like the Chinese uh, rocket has already attempted but failed to reach orbit. So we've already had one attempt. So relativity would be the second that we know of. Um, of course, it's sequencing with Starship is still to be determined. Um, 
But yeah, it, it, it is very interesting because methane was so largely ignored as a fuel um, for, for so long. And now everyone, including KSP, is just turning to it, uh, you know, in, in almost in lockstep uh, here for our future exploration plan. So it's really, it's, it's going to be exciting to see who's first, honestly. Yeah, it's, I think I said it somewhere the, the other day where people are like, oh, it's such an artificial like race. And I'm like, yeah, but it's an exciting one. It's a, like yeah. a race that has no harm. It's just funny to watch to see who's the first methane rocket to orbit. There, there's no, there's of course no price money. There's nothing behind this. It's just interesting to see. And I like that kind of race because there's, there's no hard feelings attached to it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, looks like uh, there there will be an attempt soon. Of course, there could be scraps with the first attempt. And here we see them actually assembling their rocket, which of course has a high three D printing factor involved, since that's their their main yeah their main selling point. So uh, yeah, um, question here about Terran One. Uh, there's uh, how will Terran R compare to Terran One? So. Yeah, there's a, it's a it's a very much different rocket with uh, Terran one to Terran R, right, Chris? Oh gosh, it, I, I guess the best way to describe this is it's kind of the difference between Falcon Nine and Starship. If you just scale Starship down a little bit, um, but they're really yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the best way, Alex. I mean that that's kind of how I would describe it. Yeah, it's it's like the Terran one basically launches like a ton to orbit, but then Terran R is gigantic. It has the performance of a Falcon 9, but it's fully reusable. So it needs to be even larger than Falcon 9. So yeah, it's it's sort of, as you said, it's it's like the transition from Falcon 9 to Starship, but obviously both downscaled, right. uh, one to, to one ton launcher, and then the other one to about 20 tons to low Earth orbit. But but again, the one, you know, the, the, the 20 ton to low Earth orbit, that, that Terran R rocket is fully reusable, so it needs to be larger in order to incorporate that, you know, all the dry mass into recovery systems and all of that lowers performance, so you need a bigger rocket. And yeah, it's probably going to be maybe in between Vulcan and New Glenn in terms of the size, most likely. Just the size out of the top of my yeah. head. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the size, I think it's probably in between Vulcan and New Glenn. So you can imagine, we're talking about a, a rocket that is smaller than than Falcon 9 and, and like maybe the, the same size as Alpha from, from Firefly, uh, going from that to one that is even larger than Vulcan. So, yeah. Certainly a big step and for that company. Uh, just to uh, recap here, since, since uh, it was asked, how will Terran run actually... Uh, how will Terran R actually be uh, recovered for the second stage? Like, do, did they already detail what kind of reusability they are going for with the second stage? I don't think they have talked about that yet. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe they have either. Yeah, there will probably be some updates about that in the future, most likely. But so far, they haven't really said much. About that second stage, the first Each stage we know certainly guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, they they said they have like new materials, secret materials that they can three D print that will mean no heat shield. We'll see about that. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah. heat shield built in. See, so still still in. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. It's still there. <laughs> it's like a stoke with a with a heat shield on the bottom with all yes. the thrusters <laughs> and everything. It's it's just still a heat shield. It's just a little bit more innovative kind of yeah, thinking feel, there feels a bit like a technicality where like uh we integrated the heat shield into your hill and they're like okay so you have a heat shield it's right. just <laughs> in a different place yeah it's just um, no tiles and, and things like that but it's still yes. there amiga clone asking here do you know if there was any specific reason for methane being ignored as a rocket fuel and i can actually take the first part of that because i uh, did an article back in uh, like 2022 with uh, thomas about that and there's multitude of reasons one of of course is the push to mars where uh, it just makes sense meth to have methane as a fuel as it's uh generatable on on that planet so uh there's this connection there but there's also other reasons for example methane has a bit more problems with uh combustion stability 
which was a problem they experienced in the past and which prevented methane to being used. So that's like two of the reasons where why methane was not considered and RP1, for example, was preferred. Mm. And also, so, you got to understand the history of, of everything. Like they first went with the easy kind of rocket fuels, which were like the, the nearest thing to, to jet fuel, like first jet fuel on some right. of the first orbital rockets, then like the ne nearest one is like a little bit more refined kerosene and things like that. And the immediate thinking was like, okay, now we're gonna develop engines that are like on the highest performing engine, things like that, which were liquid hydrogen. So they didn't mm -hmm. think about anything in between because they were laser focused on, you know, first we're gonna learn how to actually make usable rocket engines with easier fuels, and then we're gonna go for the higher performance, uh, nothing in between. Then obviously as the industry evolved, hey, methane is here, it's kind of in the middle, so let's take it. And, and another sort of idea in that swing that you had mentioned, Adrian, about like now, now the idea of Mars and pressing onward into the solar system, and it's where we can find it. Specifically, it's the carbon dioxide in Mars's atmosphere. It's the carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, and the sort of abundance of that element throughout element, not an element compound. Whew, sorry, science teachers everywhere. Um, <laughs> that compound throughout the solar system. It's very common, and when you break that down, you get not only oxygen, but you get methane as well. So it's it's a it's very easy to pull it from the atmosphere, scrub it from the atmosphere, pull it apart, and then put it back together in the components that you need it to. Um, and there's some benefits to it as well in the in the rocketry design because oxygen and methane have very similar temperatures in which they are at which they are liquid, um, as opposed to hydrogen and oxygen. So it makes common bulkheads a little bit easier than hydrolox rockets, even though they do exist in hydrolox rockets, but it, it makes it, it <laughs> yeah, it, 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 but it does make it a little bit easier when your propellants have very similar temperatures in that regard. There we go. Moving on here, uh, before we move to the next topic, I want to uh, thank Jim Cavett, who gifted the one red team membership here. Thank you so much. And uh, the lucky person who received that, make sure to thank Jim there in the chat. And also David Dean here with the $5 super chat and asking, do you think NASA intends to build its moon base on the recently named mountain near the lunar South Pole, Mons Moton, Moton, given that's where Wiper will scout? Oh, good question. Um, the, so the, I, the, so they have not specifically determined like which one they're going to build at, um, but Shackleton is the one that gets mentioned quite a bit because it's 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 got large indications of deposits of, of ice in in the area. So Shackleton is probably a, a, a good bet. But one of the things that one of the reasons that Viper is going to uh, different places and that they're going to send the rovers to different places is sort of specifically for that, like go in situ, scout what's actually there and then make your informed decision as to where you actually put the base. There we go. I uh, hope that answers your question, David. And thank you again for the super chat. Moving on to another methane rocket. It's really a methane heavy episode today uh, with the ULA Vulcan update. Chris, there were some updates on Vulcan and uh, the status of uh, of its progress to launch. What's the what's the deal there? Yes, yes. As you said, continuing our uh, our, our our round through the methane rockets today. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is really important. So Vulcan is getting ready for rollout. Um, so rollout for testing is upcoming. They don't have a precise date for it just yet. Uh, but it will be sometime soon. Uh, so Vulcan is currently inside of the vertical integration facility at Slick 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, technically Kennedy Space Center property on lease to Cape Canaveral, but you know, minutia. Uh, but the reason they are going to be taking Vulcan out to the launch pad is for a series of demonstration and flight readiness tests. So there will be at least one tanking test, not a wet dress rehearsal, just a tanking test to fully validate the fueling systems for both the, um, for both the Vulcan and the Centaur upper stage. 
Um, if you recall the test articles that were out there, there was a Vulcan first stage test article that was out there, but this is really the first time they're going to take the entire vehicle through everything. So that is why they're going to start with a tanking test. Um, if the tanking test is successful or in multiple, or if it takes multiple tanking tests for them to get the data, then they move on to at least one wet dress rehearsal, which is basically everything but light the engines. Um, and if they need to do more than one, they'll do more than one before proceeding down to a flight readiness firing of the two BE-4 engines. Uh, they will fire at 70% of a rate of performance for three and a half seconds um, held down onto the launch pad by the vertical, uh, by the umbilical tower and, and launch stand itself. Uh, and really at this point, um, a good part of the pacing to the flight readiness review is those BE-4 engines. So Blue Origin is still taking them through the overall qualification sequence of tests on their test stands. And one of the previous, and the test is currently on pause right now because one of the latest ones, the oxygen pump actually overperformed by about 5% during an acceptance test firing. And... Uh, and, and an investigation into that basically revealed that that overperformance is within what's called the unit to unit deviation, meaning under nominal mission, um, um, nominal mission trajectories and performances, you would never in this would this type of an overperformance would never deplete the oxygen tank um, or get you into what's called a low level cutoff scenario where you've depleted the oxygen to the point where the sensors go, whoa, 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 we're running empty. We need to shut the engines down for safety um, to keep them from exploding. Um, so you would not see that during a normal flight performance. You could potentially get into a scenario where if you were far enough into the flight and you lost one of the BE-4 engines and you were burning the remaining one longer, that that might run into an issue. But after flight five or six is what Tori said, is when that would become a problem. But they're understanding the issue. They're resuming the acceptance testing with it. And basically... Now that they understand that it's something that can be accounted for in the countdown and the oxygen load that goes into the vehicle and the overall understanding of how the engines are going to perform and drain the oxygen from the tank. So all of that gets us to the big question, right, Adrian and Alex? When launch, right? Yes. <laughs> That's what we really <laughs> want to know, right, is when launch, because it's assembled, it's got testing. So this is where its sequencing with Starliner becomes very important. Starliner has priority on the manifest for the for the latter half of April. So, so mid to late April, Starliner on an Atlas V has the priority. And then after that, Vulcan enters its four-day launch window that opens on May 4th. So technically, the Vulcan will be ready by mid-April, but the Peregrine lunar launch trajectory window ends in early April and the next one opens on May 4th. So they push to May 4th and that gets you your opening launch date. Uh, the Peregrine Lunar Lander, the Kuiper satellites and the Celestis uh, Memorial payloads that will be on board are all anticipated to be ready for the May 4th window. Um, and then it will really just come down to has Starliner lifted off? What's the priority here? Can Starliner scooch after it based on ISS, um, uh, based on ISS needs, and that will really sort of determine the overall sequencing here. But May 4th does appear to be the current target for Vulcan's debut flight. Just want to instantly start with Paul Kelly's uh, uh, point about this here. Can we talk about this, how supremely disrespected it is to launch a Vulcan on Star Wars Day? And I... <laughs> 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 I mean, April 5th would have been better, yes, but uh, pesky yeah, mid-April readiness. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, this. Uh, the, I, I feel that. Um, I, you know I what, think and, it's... and like, just, just to like really dig in, like we should have Daniel Radcliffe say, may the fourth be with you, Vulcan, and be dressed like Gandalf when he does it. Like, that should just complete the, you know, <laughs> yes, Adrian, look. <laughs> I'm in physical pain. Um, <laughs> okay, let's let's move on from this very cursed question. Uh, Starship24 asking, will Vulcan be able to have SRB configurations like Atlas V? Ooh, to an extent, um, symmetrical. So it can have, um, so it has to have an even number of solids. It cannot have an odd number. So it can't be one, three or five. It's got to be either two, four or six. 
Um, and yeah, and that's for the that's for the symmetry of the thrust on the vehicle. So uh, the BE fours do not have the thrust vector control authority as the RD one eighty does to counter that type of thrust from uh, from from the Gem sixty three XL solid rocket boosters, which are the the, uh, the uprated versions of the boosters that the Atlas V currently uses. So we are not getting combinations like, for example, the big slider. Where we have like no, one SRB. No, if Vulcan power slides off the launch pad, something has gone very wrong. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Um, another question here. Uh, how much do each BE4 engine cost and how much do they actually protect Palant cost? I do not think we believe, uh, know any of these numbers nope. as ULA and Blue Origin have. Uh, you could probably calculate the fuel costs yes. based on market values, but you cannot calculate the engine cost, I believe, because they probably do not share these. That is exactly correct. Um, it's a very good question, but Blue and ULA have absolutely not talked about that at all. Yeah. Uh, I, th I would be very curious. I, I understand that question, though, because it would be very interesting how much ULA pays for each BE4. That's uh, definitely interesting. Yeah. I it would be interesting to also see what they pay for it versus what it costs because contracts were signed quite a while ago uh, for the BE4s and the development program was not exactly smooth thereafter. So, but they got there and that's the important part. They did get there, but it would be interesting to see that uh, element of the relationship here. I, I'm also, this is a more a topic that I always think about because it will be interesting down the line if New Glenn becomes operational and we have a situation where, for example, Vulcan and New Glenn will compete for certain missions because suddenly you have the one side of Blue Origin who definitely has an interest to sell the engines and the other side of Blue Origin has an interest to undercut the competition in price. So I feel like there's an interesting dynamic which might come up here in terms of competition. And especially since the Space Force just amended how they are doing an SSL awards here um, last week. We actually haven't had a chance to talk about this on an NSF Live because it came up on the 16th, uh, but they're basically creating two lanes. So the, the types of contracts that SpaceX and ULA won in the round two competitions are still in existence as lane two, but lane one sort of allows companies like Rocket Lab and Blue Origin, which can't prove that their rockets can get to all of the different orbits and Rocket Lab, especially, right? Like Rocket Lab it would, would struggle to do a geostationary orbit insertion mission, yeah. right? Because of the size of the rocket, but they could certainly launch an SSL payloads into LEO, right? But because they can't do them all, they're excluded from bidding on any of them. And this is one of the things that the Space Force is changing. So Rocket Lab Blue Origin, even if they can't, and, and, you know, Relativity is included in this as well. Um, uh, Firefly Alpha is included in this as well. Even if their rockets can't go to all of the different orbits the Space Force needs, and that is still largely just Falcon, uh, SpaceX and, and ULA, hey, all of these others could probably, could maybe do it for cheaper than they could, but you got to open up that competition and they have as a matter of fact so yeah how all of that interplay is going to happen now with how the nssl awards are changing and of course some of the ones that spacex and ula were awarded are now up for rebid as well under nssl2 as part of this restructure so also very interesting because i'm really curious to see if vulcan loses some of what it would have been awarded because it's not ready yet and because there have been some delays to it uh, but this also potentially benefits spacex too with starship's development and onboarding starship to this overall so like it, it it's, it's a very as the ferenki would say lucrative move on behalf of the space force to open it up this way yeah and they yes. also said it's it's also valuable because they said that they had expected for nssl phase two they expected somewhere around 30 launches. And now after, you know, adding some some more launches and things like that, they have actually ended up with over 40 launches already uh, for NSSL phase two. So for phase three, they're kind of thinking, you know, 60 or 70 might be on the docket for, for you know, 
to to be able to share between all of these. And so they're thinking like lane two might be 30 to 40 launches and then lane one may be 20 or even 30. So when you have so many launches that are like low risk, you can probably take that extra risk of, you know, going to the, to the, mm, to the, to the other folks that don't have mm-hmm. much experience and, and onboard new, new rockets as well and diversify the fleet. That kind of makes sense as well because you have a lot of launches. So you yeah. put more rockets. And, and to be clear too, that SpaceX and ULA are not prohibited from bidding on mm-hmm. lane one missions. They, they can still totally bid on them and could still yeah. totally win them. Um, it's just opening them up to other other bidders as well. Like you said, Alex, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Uh, and very regular super chatter here, Musical Wolves with the five dollars super chat. Thank you so much uh, for always being on these. It's uh, very very regular. Will ULA do a full duration test, like for example the SLS Green Run? I believe the answer is no, right, Chris? No. So the qualification campaign that they are doing to say that the BE fours are ready to lift off. So the two that are on board. Um, have undergone um, acceptance test firings, and then they're really doing test firings on qualification on the final qualification engines that are built the exact same way as the ones on here are, and they're doing those at full duration uh, firings on the on the test stands, and that's how they're qualifying the overall engines for first flight. There we go. Uh, also, it's uh, time for me here by Ninja Decimator to merge by Alex. Um... <laughs> <laughs> which uh, we have a NSF sticker here, and we also have uh, a Falcon Heavy shirt of the new Falcon Heavy collection. Very uh, collection, very nice collection. I had that on for most of the uh, last few days, always when I was here. But uh, now I don't anymore. And also a launch oh. entry landing, very on brand for tonight's Falcon Nine launch. So there we go. Yeah, just making sure that. Uh, we're displaying these. Uh, also, we have uh, a when mark, uh, when hop mark. Uh, I have that, but I'm right now drinking of of my when sleep. It's another very on brand topic. <laughs> and I'm, also, I'm, an SLS I'm mark. drinking from my mugs are dirty and in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at some point you have to like rotate, right? It's uh, there's only so many mugs, but there's there's certainly a certain amount of coffee. So exactly, yes, this must be consumed each day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's hit two more questions here before we move on. Uh, one question that is very on brand for China, so I can take that one. Uh, on uh, methane rockets, uh, do we have any updates on Zukui 2's second attempt? Um, the answer is no. There. Uh, so just for context, Zukui 2 was the rocket that uh, attempted to be the first methane rocket in orbit, uh, but failed on uh, about three kilometers a second short, so didn't enter orbit. But uh, yeah, they, they, we saw pictures of the second flight being very like advanced and already advanced state, which all tanks and everything. But of course, that also depends on the investigation of what went wrong and what they need to change. So, so far, we have not heard a new launch target for Zuki 2. Just to hit that quickly. Um, and one final question here on Vulcan. Does ULA need to de-stack after the, uh, after the two qualification firing? Uh, no, they do not need to destack Centaur and Vulcan. Um, after the qualification firings and the flight readiness firings, if once all of those are passed and they pull Vulcan from the actual launch pad, uh, Vulcan will either but Vulcan will first go back to one of the storage facilities um, a bit further away from Pad Forty One, where the old Titan rockets were integrated together and then the atlas with starliner which will be stacked as well while vulcan is out on the pad will then come out of the vertical integration facility and take the pad for the starliner launch and then after that vulcan will come back to have payload integration um and then it will go out to the pad for its liftoff as well certainly a very busy time for ula coming up uh, which is good. Yes, but a good moment for them to get used to shuffling between Atlas and Vulcan because the Vul- Vulcan is bigger, yeah. so it has its own mobile launch tower and, and and platform. So they're not sharing launch platforms, which is a large part of what enables this, as well as Vulcan's ability to be to do some of its stacking in one of the old Titan buildings as well. Now they've done it all inside the vertical integration facility so far, 
Um, but um, so so uh, so anyway, yeah, um, they, they really have to get used to going back and forth between the two vehicles because there's still about 18 or so atlases left on the manifest to fly out as well as Vulcan comes online. There we go. Uh, that certainly covers our our part of Vulcan of the show, which uh, yeah, certainly is entering a very interesting time here. Um, so I'm looking forward to see a lot of Methalox in the upcoming months, which uh, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely interesting because one slip can suddenly mean that another rocket is in the lead. So we will see how this all plays out. And good luck, of course, to Vulcan once it happens. Because right now, other... right, right, okay. Alex, um, Relativity and uh... And SpaceX are both March, uh, the 8th yeah. of March for Relativity March. and SpaceX is March, as far as we know. <laughs> and and then Vulcan is May. So there's a distinct possibility that three methane rockets in three months could attempt their liftoffs. Plus yeah. also Circuit 2 might right. try as well <laughs> with between, because they, they had that issue on December. So maybe they're already back on track or something. We don't know, but... They're, they're certainly going to be attempting something soon, probably. Yeah. Interesting, for sure. We Also, it was, was very interesting was a launch uh, to the International Space Station just a few days ago, which was the launch of the Zoyus MS-23. Alex, do you want to give us an overview why this launch was so interesting? Yeah, so it was a weird launch because we didn't have any SpaceX launch, but we did have the Soyuz launch of the MS-23 spacecraft. And... This one is actually replacing the, well, sort of, yeah, replacing the MS-22 spacecraft that had a coolant leak uh, back in December of last year. Um, this mission was launched on crewed without any sort of people on board. It, it did carry some cargo up to the International Space Station because, you know, just because they're already launching that, so why not? Um, and, yeah, it, it seemed to go well so far. Uh, Dock to the International Space Station, all well, in automatic mode, uh, as you can imagine, without any crew on board. Uh, but that is mostly what, what it usually does, the Soyuz, uh, with the eventual rogue um, curse system not functioning sometimes. But that is that is very unusual and, and very unlikely. And, and it, it docked to the, to the space station very well. This uh, Soyuz will now be, so there, the crew on board the ISS will now swap the seats, the seats for liner from Soyuz MS-22, at least for the two cosmonauts, from Soyuz MS-22 to Soyuz MS-23. Frank Rubio's seat liner was on Crew Dragon, I think it's Endurance, uh, as like a, a fifth seat of sorts on board the capsule. So now it's going to be transferred to the new uh, vehicle, Soyuz MS-23. And Soyuz MS-22 will eventually undock. Uh, it will re-enter nominally. They will gather the data um, that they can from that. Uh, you know, just basically seeing uh, how it performs uh, uh, on during free, free flight and during return. Sadly, the section with the coolant leak is not uh, like it doesn't survive re-entry, so they are not able to to perform any actual hands-on testing on it. They have to test that remotely and see how it's the performance of Soyuz without. All of that coolant uh, on board, uh, but so far we'll see. That's that's sort of the the, the plan right now. The Soyuz Soyuz MS twenty three will also remain on station for the foreseeable future for like six months, as a usual Soyuz will do. Um, the difference for the crew, obviously, is that they are already they have been already six months on the ISS. So now they're going to keep going for another six months, and they're going to be staying up there for a year. So that's. I think that's actually the first time that like the full complement of a Soyuz has stayed up there for for a year. We've seen some missions that have been there for like nine, 10, 11 months. Uh, but this is going to be the first one, like the whole crew is going to stay up there for those 12 months. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see what data comes out of it, because I suppose they're going to take advantage of that to take also some data on you know, long duration space flights and things like that. There we go. Um, we have some questions about this. Uh, first off, Tony uh, saying MS-23 messes with my launch stats. Is it crewed or not, given it has a landing crew? That's an interesting <laughs> edge case because, well, it, it's not crewed first and then it became screw, uh, becomes crewed. 
it's also not the first time this happened though there right. was a i think in in the 80s or maybe the 90s maybe the 80s because it was a solid um mm -hmm. uh, station they had an issue with the with the engine on i think it was soyuz 32 and it was soyuz 33 the one that they launched as rescue sort of like replacement i think it, it's sort of the, those numbers Again, don't recall, like, I'm literally saying this off the top of my head, but you can Google that, maybe uh, just the numbers and things like that. But, yeah, it, it's, it, it happened before that they have launched an uncrewed Soyuz just to replace a previous one. It's also not the first time that they've launched uh, an uncrewed Soyuz in general. Uh, this is actually, I think, the third time uh, in the recent times so there's been that soyuz replacement there was also a soyuz tma that was launched uh and crewed as a test demo of that capsule and then there was also a soyuz ms launched the soyuz ms 14 that was also launched in august 2019 to the iss for some similar purposes of like testing about validating soyuz, the soyuz uh, rocket yeah yeah exactly well I mean, on, on the one hand, it was because they were looking into an uncrewed Soyuz variant for cargo and things like that. But also, I remember that as well. They were also testing the the new rocket, the Soyuz 2.1A, uh, that that is now used for these crewed launches. And it was really, it was a really interesting reason they had to test it. It wasn't that the you know like oh Soyuz might not be able like the Soyuz capsule might not be able to talk to the Soyuz rocket. It's that the old. It's that the Soyuz crew capsules have never launched before on a rocket that could perform the roll maneuver to get onto the proper azimuth, like the Soyuz 2.1As can. And they literally needed to make sure that the Soyuz capsules systems would not trigger mm -hmm. an in-flight abort when the rocket started to roll. And that was that was the largest reason for launching that one uncrewed. Yeah. Yeah. It happened once, or maybe I'm, mis I'm misremembering that one time, long time ago in the Soyuz history, where the launch escape system activated just because the rocket was sitting on the pad. I think they, they had to scrap the launch or something like that. It's oh, par but partially that was, yeah. remembering. Yes, but that was actually like and, the, the, the lift. They, the engines lit. They had to shut down, but there was a yeah. legitimate problem on the ground, and and the and the no, escape no, no, system I'm, did trigger. I'm thinking. Yeah. No, but I'm thinking of an, of another one where it triggered, it was uncrewed, and the reason for that was that the the Earth had been rotating. So in the time that they actually oh, took to, one. okay, yeah, it was an uncrewed mission of a test Soyuz, and the the launch was aborted, and the 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 way that the capsule actually measures those things is the angles and things like that, and the Earth had been rotating because it rotates, and so the time passed and there was a point where the capsule was like, hey, I'm moving, <laughs> right? And so it, it basically sensed that and activated the, the launch escape system. It was weird, one off, but it can happen that, you know, just yeah. because your rocket is a little bit off. So obviously when you have a rocket that now can finally roll uh, like that one, you obviously do those kind of tests. One question we have here from Adrian, nice name, by the way. It's the uh, it's what's the guarantee that this Soyuz won't spring a leak? I haven't heard of them huh. identifying what caused the leak. Was there actually like a deep investigation into this? It's been kind of mixed signals from Roscosmos because they've been talking about micrometeorites, like and, and orbital debris, like MMODs, as as we usually say. And the thing is, the issue with the Progress MS twenty one, I think it is, and the Soyuz MS twenty two the locations are very similar. So that prompts the question like, how are the chances, right? That, that it's so close in the location of the radiator loops that these mm, incidents happened, right? And so it's, it's a little bit complicated to think that it is both cases, MMODs, and not something else, but they haven't really said anything else other than, yeah, we'd look into it, we'd capture photos and things like that. And well, it's MMOD and it's like, okay, but isn't there any possibility, you know, that it's still up in the air, but yeah. There we go. Hope that answers your question. Uh, we hope, of course, it won't spring another leak. And uh, this one is 
fine without any problems. Uh, before we move on here, I want to thank Dougal for five red team memberships gifted. Uh, make sure I already saw some people saying thank you to Dougal. Uh, thank you so much for that, Dougal. And uh, yeah, I hope people enjoy their membership perks, such as exclusive, uh, like access to some photos, some high res photos in the membership area, which is always nice to see. So let's move on here to our, I think, uh, the big topics uh, in terms of what like happens very, very soon, uh, which is the crew launch of tonight. SpaceX Crew 6 coming up. Chris, want to give us an overview about what we expect tonight? Yes, indeed. So a brand new Falcon 9 rocket is set to launch the Endeavour capsule on its fourth trip to the International Space Station after previously flying Demo 2, Crew 2, and Axiom 1. Uh, on board will be four international crew members, Commander Stephen Bowen, uh, who is a NASA astronaut and a three-time veteran of space shuttle missions STS-126, 132, and 133. Fun fact, he is the only person in the shuttle era to fly back-to-back -back space shuttle missions on 132 and 133. And he will be joined, but this is his first long duration mission to the International Space Station. So that is important to note. His others were up and down on the exact same mission. And he will be joined by three rookies. So joining him is pilot Woody Hoberg from NASA. Uh, and also joining is mission specialist Sultan al Niadi from the United Arab Emirates and mission specialist Andrei Fedyaev from Russia. Also a happy 42nd birthday to Andre today. So missing out by a launch on his birthday by one hour and 45 minutes, but I think suiting up and going to the launch pad counts and, and we can give that to him uh, today. But the crew has been at the Kennedy Space Center for about a week. They completed their dry dress rehearsal, um, basically the crew's walkthrough of launch day. They completed that early Thursday morning and then SpaceX teams then stepped into fueling the rocket without the crew on board and conducted the static fire at 5.55. At 5.45 a.m. on Thursday morning. Uh, that was uh, completed with booster B-1078, which is a first flight booster. And again, Endeavor making its Dragon record fourth flight to space today. But um, uh, Alex, I want to turn it over to you for this next part because there were some issues and some open items that were discussed at the flight readiness reviews and launch readiness reviews as well for this particular mission. Yeah, so prior to the static fire test and the dry dress rehearsal, they conducted a flight readiness review with NASA, like SpaceX, NASA, and all the the partners of the International Space Station. And some of the open items, um, like one of one of the things that I think stand, stood out for me was the presence of an engine fire. Uh, not not well, not engine fire, more like fire in the engine bay on booster. Uh, 1062, which had flown on the previous Starlink mission, Starlink 5-4. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of looking at the notes here as well. And that mission, apparently, the the center engine had a, a, a fire in the in in the engine bay, and so they had been looking at it. They were it was sort of an uh, an open item. The booster had also come back to port like two days before or something like that. So it, it was very fresh data that they had seen already. Uh, so they needed a little bit more of time there. They went into the static fire test. One of the things that they mentioned afterwards, uh, after the launch readiness review, which occurred yesterday, um, and after the static fire, what they mentioned was that they think that the cause of the fire might come down to a leak on an oxygen, like on, on a joint, a leak of oxygen on one of the joints on that section of the booster. And it appears that also the, the boot, basically the engine is protected by a, by some kind of cloth there uh, to protect it from, from the from re-entry and, and also for ascent. And that engine boot had been already flown all 12 flights that the booster had been flying. The flight, the, like the booster is a very, very high flight number, 12 flights already compared to this one, which is first flight. And one of the things that they also found out, it's that that boot might have basically had residuals in it that have contributed to the fire as well. It was a small fire. It didn't affect the engine performance. It did well, like it landed perfectly with, you know, another streak of 
I think it was the 99th successful lending in a row for that, uh, you know, for, for, for the Falcon program. So it, it, was, it didn't affect the performance of the booster, but it obviously, you know, you see that. And one of the questions on, on these conferences was, have you seen this on other boosters? And they were like, yeah, the other boosters that even have more flights, we have m much more data and everything, haven't presented this. So obviously we wanted to take to to take a look and make sure that this wasn't present on the booster flying on, on this mission. So they did the static fire, they leak test on uh, those joints to make sure that you know there wasn't any leak or anything, and they cleared the issue perfectly. But definitely something to 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 know that you know sometimes these little issues appear on the boosters. And the overall theme of these conferences was actually that you know both NASA and SpaceX are very glad that, you know, SpaceX has these high cadence of flights. These stunning flights help them a lot to gather data. These high booster numbers as well, that they can fly them many times. So they're able to, to gather all of these data ahead of flights and be sure that everything is safe. That's definitely something that, that they can, that they can say it's, it's a great uh, advantage. One of the, one of the uh, exciting things, well, not exciting, but more like, Interesting things that that I also found out from that conferences was that there were there were uh, there were questions about what SpaceX might have done to protect Dragon from MMODs, just like Soyuz and Progress have you know leaks and things like that. And one of the things that they mentioned is that the radiator loops are you know they they have two radiator loops, they are redundancy like they have redundancy on board them, but also they have tested you know hitting the thrusters, like the Draco thrusters with MMODs, like simulated MMODs, and having holes in the chambers of these thrusters and firing them, and they were fired successfully without any sort of uh, repercussion to the, to the vehicles or anything. So that seemed to me very interesting. Um, Sleek 40 tower construction underway with foundations already put in place. The critical design review phase right now is where they stand right now with the crew access tower, the arm and everything. And it should be ready for cargo flights in Q3 of this year and cargo and crew flights a little bit later. Um, yeah, I think I hit sort of the most important. There, there were a couple of more things, but these are like a few things that stood out for me at least. There we go. That was a quite juicy update from you both on uh, Crew 6. So if everybody wanted to prepare for the launch later, there you go. But we have some questions here. Um, with Crew 6 Endeavor already flown four times, do we know what the expected limit for Crew Dragon is and how much it can fly? I could hit that one because yeah. right now they are they are certified for five flights. SpaceX wants to extend that certification all the way to 15 flights for Crew Dragon and Cargo Dragon. So both right now, both Cargo Dragon and Crew Dragon are for those five flights are, are certified for five flights right now. But yeah, as, as mentioned, they want to extend it all the way to 15 uh, so that they can basically put in place, you know, many, many flights in those uh, capsules so that they are able to, to launch many times. Uh, there's a very, well, not healthy because it's still not uh, not in full fledged, but let's say that there's a lot of promising things in the in, in the horizon for Crew Dragon in terms of missions between you know Axiom, Polaris missions, and then also in the future commercial Leo destinations. So there's definitely room for more missions to, to pop up, and that will definitely help. One thing that I remember, though, I didn't point, I didn't put this on the on on the notes, but there are new Teslas for Crew Six, so they have yes, new black. black Teslas, yes, yeah. yeah. And apparently, they they were asked about that, and they said it in very basic terms that because they have more missions now, they also have more vehicles, more cars, and so they have more diverse fleet of white and black cars, you know, with different logos and different histories. So not only the capsules, but also the cars seem to have certifications, so to speak. Uh, obviously joking, but yeah, they, they seem to also have like... They were running out flights. of sticker space on the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. It, it becomes a safety hazard with too many stickers. It's like uh, you can't see anymore. 
Um, <laughs> we have a question here by Outdoors Mancho, uh, which um, I think also might touch on the shuttle topic we sometimes mention here on the show, which is, had there ever been an international pilot on an American craft other than the Axiom mission? No, and that was the first. There we go. Uh, I was not sure about the, the shuttle missions, if there was ever like a non- so there we go on that. No. I was thinking, um, wait, what action mission? And then I remember Michael. <laughs> yeah, and um, <laughs> yeah, but, um, but no, in terms of a, in terms of an international pilot, um, yeah, no, the shuttle never had that because the qualifications to be a pilot and a commander of the shuttle was that you had to be a U.S. military officer. So by definition, <laughs> you were going to be a U.S. citizen to be a commander or a pilot on a shuttle flight. And soon there, there will be. So we had obviously. And there are Michael. no such restrictions um, for yeah. dragons and starliners and Orions. Yeah. And in exactly. fact, in Starliner, Sunny Williams will be the, it will mark the first time that a woman will fly on the first orbital crew flight of a new launch vehicle in history. And, 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 and the interesting thing is that uh, because I just, it don't be that, you know, Michael, Axiom One, but for, for NASA missions, I think it is. Crew seven, the one where Andres Mogensen, uh, a European, uh, basically an ESA uh, mm -hmm. astronaut, is going to be a pilot for yes. that for that Crew Dragon. So, an European being pilot of an American spacecraft is like, hey, you know, First time, yeah. kind of a, a a big deal. That's, exactly. that's going to be exciting. Oh, Europe. <laughs> So, sorry. Um, <laughs> quite another question here about it. Dragon and its uh, yeah capacity. Will is there any plans, or will they ever fly a Dragon with a full crew crew of seven? Is there a very important anything? caveat here? Full crew for Dragon is four. Above that is the contingency carrying capability that the capsules can do under non-nominal situations. Hmm. So there's no plan right now, or as we know, about any mission or anything where they would launch with more than four. Not now. No. The the design for the extra seats was not continued beyond four, but they can carry more if they need to. And of course, with enough lead time, SpaceX could make something possible, but not right now. No. And let's hope we never see us a, uh, a crew dragon carry more than four down because otherwise that would mean serious issues <laughs> yeah i mean something's yeah. gone very wrong and they weren't able to get to the soyuz yeah 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 as, as, as i said uh frank rubio had that basically there's his seat liner was underneath the the row of four seats i think it was the one on the left if you are looking at the mm -hmm. controls so that is basically where where it was sitting and yeah, if if they if that were to happen one day, that means there's an there's an emergency up there on the ISS, and we don't want that. Let's say uh, hit one final question here about Crew Six. If you have more Crew Six questions though after this, make sure to turn out into our webcast of that because we will broadcast, of course, the Crew Six mission, and you will be able to ask anything you want there over the whole cast. So that we will true, answer right? anything. And you can join us at 10 p.m. Eastern, 3 UTC for that live coverage of the Crew 6 launch. I hate sleep anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be sleeping until I drive back home after launch. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a long night for, for a lot of people. So there we go. Uh, one final question. How long will Crew 6 be in space? Approximately six months. There we go. That's uh, the usual like duration mm. for these crew rotations, right? It's like always about six months, exactly. give or take. There Sometimes depending on the mission might be like five, just because they want to like schedule missions a little bit left and right in their manifest. But yeah, it's usually six months. Okay, let me uh, hit uh, what Kevin bought here in our shop first before we move on, because we have some more possibilities to uh, show what people bought here. We have, oh, nice, that's a good one. That's a Delta for a heavy metal print. That's a great decision right there, Kevin. What a brilliant oh, no, idea not... to do. Yeah. I'm not biased at all, but uh, what a what a brilliant decision. How, how fitting that I get the Delta for heavy uh, right here. So uh, let's move on here. With what also, yeah. <laughs> How also much did you a... pay him for that purchase? <laughs> yeah, my, my alternative name is also Kevin. It's like, a... yeah. <laughs> oh, I... there we go. 
And also we have um, we have uh, a five dollar super chat here by Dave, uh, who said he bought bacon. Congratulations on that bacon. It's a very uh, reoccurring topic on our cast. But Jack sadly is not here today, so uh, so it's the bacon specialist is missing. What is no longer missing is something we added to our shop recently, which uh, is very fitting to what is happening tonight. Because if you go to the metal print section in our shop, you will now see three brand new Falcon 9 metal prints, which are by uh, Brady, Pauline and Nathan, our photographers, added uh, to the shop. Because we noticed, yeah, there's a certain lack of Falcon 9 in our, in our metal prints, which because sometimes they feel like so routine, but of course it's a gorgeous rocket we want to showcase there as well with the amazing photography. So make sure to check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com and check out these uh, new Falcon 9 metal prints or any other metal print you uh, you might want to have on your wall. I can certainly tell you I like them, <laughs> as you can see behind me. Uh, so yeah, make sure to check out the shop. Moving on to a very special Starlink mission, which uh, is interesting because usually Starlinks are became kind of routine. But what yeah. is so special <laughs> about Starlink 6-1, Alex? Yeah, so we talk about how we're not going to sleep a lot. But then also, there's more launches after Crew 6. There's a Starlink 6-1, there's a Starlink 2-7. It's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be crazy. But yeah, one of them is this. I think it is in the right direction, which Starlink 6-1 is going to launch the first Starlink V2 satellites. And you might wonder, oh, this is a Falcon 9. This we're going to be launching on Starship. Are they even able to fit those satellites into Falcon 9? Well, they can fit them because they have downs downsized them, basically. And they are sized for the Falcon 9 uh, fairing envelope. And you can see here there are like 21. Yeah, but like there are 21 on that stack. And they are larger. Like they fit the whole thing instead of being like two and two they're more like the whole thing uh for each layer and this time uh these these satellites actually include higher performance um how is the name uh phased array Fasters. antennas okay. well that's that's later also that. uh, okay. <laughs> more powerful phased array antennas they also add e band to their like like they have k band q band and now they also have e band a lot of different frequencies to talk to the ground, you know, and, and in between the satellites, they still have the laser links as well. Uh, that is something that hasn't changed from V1.5. But the thing is, these are large, these are larger, they are less, but they are also, they, they, they have more performance. So there's like three times less uh, satellites instead of like the usual 50 to 52 satellites that we see on regular Starlink V1.5 launches. Uh, this is going to carry 21, which is about a third, but they also have like four times the capability, the 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 data throughput. So in overall, every launch of these satellites is going to carry even more uh, than, you know, more capability than the, the previous ones. So it makes sense because the Starship right now is going to launch soon, but the first launch and even the second or third might not even carry Starlink satellites. So we're still probably a year until Star a Starship launches any Starlink satellites. In the meantime, they can launch them on Falcon 9 and they have a healthy uh, cadence of flights. So why not, right? Um, these satellites include new whole effect thrusters. They also had whole effect thrusters on the previous version. Um, but those were based on Krypton. So these are based on Argon, and they are 2.4 uh, times the thrust and 1.5 uh, the specific impulse. And I'm merch pied right now, because why not? And and so the, the good thing of this is that usually in the industry, they build the thrusters, the ion thrusters, they are built for xenon um, gas. The problem is the supply of xenon is not really that high on Earth. So if you want to build a thousand, basically like thousands and thousands of satellites that use xenon, you cannot carry this uh, fuel as, you know, as a fuel on, a, on board the vehicles. So they, they instead developed Krypton thrusters. These are like Krypton is cheaper, it's more available, more surplus around the Earth and everything. But here they're going to launch almost 
seven times more satellites and they're heavier and things like that. So they needed something. It seems like the decision here is obviously that argon is even more accessible is the third most frequent gas in the atmosphere, right? So if you have an Earth separation unit, uh, which Starbase fans might know that SpaceX has one at a Starbase, uh, those can be used to separate the Earth into at least most of these components, which are nitrogen, oxygen, and also argon. So even they themselves could even produce their own argon for these thrusters. So it's very, very beneficial for them to switch from krypton to argon. And it's not that, oh, why haven't they thought about this before? You know, why not? <laughs> Maybe they were like, why not use it now? No one thought about it. Now, it's just like meth methane, right? We were also talking about that earlier. So same thing with argon. There we go. What I also love about this photo, Adrian, is you can see the other stacks behind it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. There's like another stack just another one. ready to I just blew your mind. I could tell that. Like, oh, wait, it's, it's like... not a mirror. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's, I mean, I think it's cool, I think those... but it's also like very fitting. <laughs> I think those are actually the, the the previous version because I see a lot of them might be more starting V1.5 satellites because even though they're launching, so, so this is important to clear out, even though they're launching V2, this doesn't mean they're stopping the others, you know, like they're, they're not stopping launches of the others. One thing I will say though, recently, and I saw paperwork about this, SpaceX uh, asked the, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, they ask them for when they have to replace and replenish the first generation constellation, whether they could launch these mini satellites, these Starlink V2 mini satellites in sort of like substitution of them, uh, which is going to be interesting because it probably means that they're going to keep both constellations at the same time, uh, even when they are replacing satellites from the older one. We'll see. There we go. Yeah, it would, would be very not uh like because they have probably have some satellites on storage still of these older constellations so it makes sense to also use them right instead of mm. just making a hard cut um do we know the altitude orbit of these v2 starlink satellites for the 6-1 mission Ooh, hold up i have it right here because <laughs> um so the the alt so the orbit that they are going to be inserted to is 307 uh, uh hold up 365 by 373 at 43 degree inclination uh we're going to talk about this on the launch webcast by the way but the target orbit uh the one that they are going to be later going up to is at 540 kilometers in altitude that's the altitude that they are going to be operating at there we go um I think we talked about the Argon Thusses. Uh, one final question here. Can you tell me more about Star Shield, which is very related to this topic? Uh, is it a uh, Starlink or a new version? So what's Star Shield exactly? Because I, we have talked about it before, just a quick summary here. Good question. Uh, that I think that's basically all that I can say because we haven't really been told what exactly it is. It seems like it might be based on Starlink, but it's not a Starlink. Like it's sort of the same similar concept of flat packed and things like that, but it doesn't seem to be the exact same design, at least from like one picture and one render that we have of that. Like there's literally nothing else other than that. One picture of one in orbit and then one render with like two solar arrays or things like that. So we'll see. There we go. Uh, Musical Wolves here with the five dollar super chat. What happens to the remove before flight tags for the Starlings? Do they get reused? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not sure if there's reusability for remove before flight tags, um, but it would be on brand for uh, SpaceX to reuse the the tags. I would say. So there we go. To that you can see. I think you can see it on the right side, right? Uh, hmm. All the yeah. Kind of cool to see with the red. Let's move on to. Uh, yeah, one more methane, <laughs> which is uh, the last uh, topic of today, and of of course we always like to talk about it. Alex, there's this certain shiny rocket that we sometimes yeah. uh, talk about, Starship. What what's what's the deal with that? What's happening there? 
<laughs> so you're you're in luck because I was actually uh, part of the upcoming Starbase update uh, video that should be releasing tomorrow, hopefully. Um, I hope you'll like it, by the way. Uh, so one of the things that they that they did to the, uh, this this week uh, was testing ship twenty six, which is right here, and they cryo proofed the the vehicle. It seems like so far it didn't seem to go like you know popping or anything. But a, a weird vehicle. Uh, we might touch about that on the questions probably. Um, but yeah, it it seemed to to go without any sort of issues uh, um, at first glance. Um, some of the other stuff that we have also seen here is the orbital launch mount getting shields as well. So the orbital launch mount has started being covering, uh, been covered with shields on these on its sides. And so one of the one of the important things ahead of that launch is that you know they have the fire eggs, the concrete doesn't really get that much damage and everything. Uh, but obviously, once the rocket lifts off, you need to cover the OLM. And we have talked about that on many uh, Starbase uh, uh, live streams as well. Like, you know, are they going to cover that? Are they going to be doing anything? And obviously, it was about time, right? There's like a mess of, of pipes and, and, and other stuff right there. So it was about time that they did that. And also, um, let me see through here as well. I think, Adrian, we also have released a very fancy video featuring you as well with a thrust and countdown analysis. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's some, yeah. And there were some interesting talking points. Uh, for, for details, check, of course, out that video. But um, uh, there were some interesting numbers about, uh, since we now know the thrust numbers of uh, Booster 7 during its test and how much more it actually will produce during the orbital flight, because there's quite a difference there. Um, there was uh, there were some some interesting numbers crunching there. And of, uh, also, uh, we I, I, we are getting very close to being very able to say how long fueling will take for a booster uh, and during the countdown, which will probably be in a ballpark mm. of one hour and twenty minutes. So that was kind of interesting to to analyze, uh, and I'm really glad I got that opportunity to really dig into some numbers again because some, from time to time I really like to do that. So yeah. that was. Check out that video. Another thing that we saw this week as well was also the removal of ship 25 from pad B. And at first it was like, okay, they're removing this, but what are they doing with it? They sent it back to the production site. And it was like, is it gonna be a scrap? Is there like we were hoping that it was just that, you know, they were kind of removing it uh because they were gonna be the launch and everything, and so they were kind of uh, hiding the the ships from all the fury and 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 everything, but it seems like it went to Massey um, up the road. So after it went to the production site, then it went down on another closure. It went to to Massey, and it might be tested there. We don't know. It might be that it's actually testing the new stuff going on there. So we'll see. Um, could be e either way, right? Um, definitely. Um, Lots and lots of things. Speaking of, uh, we were talking about the Starlink as well. And one of the other things that we saw uh, was Starlink uh, satellites on on one of the on one of the buildings. I believe we can show that soon. Come on. <laughs> I'm waiting for Michael to hit it because I, I wanna, yeah, that's the Oriole launch mount shields. There we go. Uh, that's the Starlink loader. They they load the the Starlinks there and everything. And one of the the interesting things that that we saw here is a rig. Like it seems like it is to to basically load the Starlinks from whatever they're they're stacked to and then put it inside of the box. And that is very interesting because it means that they might be close to you know uh, going into more of a payload. Uh, integration testing soon as well. Uh, on that same note, uh, boost, uh, Ship 26 was also stacked in the high bay. And the interesting thing about that relationship between Starlink and Ship 27 is that Ship 24 and Ship 25 have payload bays, but both are sealed off. Ship 26 doesn't have a payload bay, but Ship 27 does have a payload bay. So will we see the first Starlink launches on Ship 27? 
I don't know, but we'll see. And we can also see here a test nose cone lifted on the test rig. That's, that is also another thing that we're looking for. Um, more testing on that nose cone as well. It is a Pathfinder nose cone. Not sure yet whether fully testing. Obviously, this is the first test of the new nose cone, which seems a little bit like untimely, might be the word, that they are now testing it when they have Ship 24 about to launch into orbit. Seems kind of counterintuitive, but yeah. Uh, so I think I hit all the all the important yes. points for, for, for the Starbase. Yeah, they, they replaced the HPUs, the hydraulic power units on Booster 7. They put uh, the arrow covers on them as well. You know, a lot of activity at the Starbase and all of it, center around that important flight that we're looking for might happen next month and you know you know finishing touches on everything around the the place and preparing next next vehicles like ship 26 ship 25 ship 27 other boosters i think we also saw parts for booster 10 going into the mega bay as well might be stacked soon overall very, very packed and very, very intensive week at a Starbase. They do not stop. <laughs> it it feels crazy how you just said in a in a say like in a sentence in a very short sentence like ship twenty four with which is very close to launch, which is like uh, just all it of the feels... like it's also there's this orbital attempt coming up. It's yeah. uh, it, like like there's so much they're doing everywhere. Of course, we see here the shielding of the orbital launch mount um being installed for example but yeah this 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 launch is coming really really close now and i learned the fact that we it doesn't feel crazy anymore to say it might launch like next month right chris not really to a large extent i mean still 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 a few ways to go on on, on a couple things but uh yeah i mean ne next month still definitely a technical possibility yes so mm. let's let's hope that happens. There's a question by Musical Wolves here. Any news on the launch license? Do we have any news on the launch license? Oh. News per se. So by the way, this view is live. I just noticed because it's save as the one on SPL. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, that's live. And <laughs> so the, the the launch license, the problem with it, it's that the 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 news about it while it is being processed, all that they can say is that yes, it's in work. They cannot say it is X close because I, I don't even think they're fully you know, aware of when things might be closed out. Obviously they, they probably have some indications of, of when things might might be closed out for, for, for that license. But obviously we won't know publicly anything until it is fully uh, finished and granted. Uh, one thing I will say though, there's sometimes these conspiracies of they won't they won't uh, announce it until we're very very close to to launch. If that were to happen, it's going to be pure coincidence that it was granted very very close to launch because the FAA is a federal agency, and these sorts of things they are sort of uh, basically they they have to release these things to the public as soon as they are granted sort of also like the FCC licenses and things like that. And you can find it on, on, on their website as well. And I actually trialed this with Terran 1 because Terran 1 got its launch license. And it was on the website just the day it was released. So we should expect the same thing to happen with the Starship. And obviously, just like Relativity tweeted, hey, we have the launch license. I wouldn't be surprised if SpaceX went like, hey, we have the launch license when they are they are granted that launch license. So don't fret, just be patient about it. And, you know, there's still work to do. So it's not like if they were granted the launch license tomorrow, they will be able to launch tomorrow, right? There's still work to do. We don't even know if there might be some testing left. We know that at least major testing, it seems like they are done with it. But last week we saw that QD testing and the spin prime and all that, that little testing that they usually do, you know, in order to nail down and kind of refine things. That is probably not unexpected, at least in my opinion. Yes. We'll see. Yeah, I think so far no one at SpaceX or at the NASA or anything like nobody has like voiced any concerns. Like nobody has said publicly like. 
uh, oh no, we think the launch license might be a blockade. And as long as we don't hear that, I'm, I'm not really worried because SpaceX in the past, and especially Elon Musk in the past, has been very vocal if uh, agencies get in into the way of launching. So as long as we don't hear like anything where somebody is worried or voices concerns, I feel like uh, that's not really a pacing item yet. That, at least that's yeah. my feeling about this. Yeah, I think Shotwell said recently on a conference that she expects the launch license to drop this March. So like they, they're going to be very close together that, you know, as they are ready for launch, they're also going to get that launch license as well. So if she thinks like that, maybe we'll see. <laughs> well, how 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 quickly be how how soon before the first Falcon Nine flight did they get the launch license? Well, that is complicated because the the launch license was also uh, so the launch itself was also pending some certification of the FTS system for Falcon Nine for that first flight. So I'm not fully sure yet on like the exact date on when that happened, but I can tell you that the, for example, things like the environmental assessment happened like a year before the launch. So seeing Starship launching a whole year after the environmental assessment was completed, which was June of last year, remember when when we thought there was going to be an issue? Uh, so, you know, it's not really unheard of because these things usually are done way before the rocket is ready. Uh, obviously, SpaceX was expecting that you know, they weren't going to be really much closer, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> they uh, always, when you mentioned the environmental assessment, I just remember four hours of PDF reading, which was by yes. far the, uh, the most <laughs> interesting. It was, it was the most riveting stream we've ever done. <laughs> yeah, we read a PDF like, for five hours. Yeah. <laughs> and some, I love the moment where we all went like, I mean, we can just read all of this, I guess. And then we just did that. <laughs> Gospel so, it up on the screen, telestrating it. Like, it was awesome. That was, yeah. That was a very, very cool I enjoyed it. Yes, it was very cool. Let's hit some question here. Um, Methane Man, very fitting name for this, asking, where would the best place to watch this launch be? South Padre Island? Yep. Yeah, it's yes. uh, with, with this Easy answer. shape kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, South Padre Island, probably the spa uh, space to go. Um, so we'll see how many people. I feel like it will be a bit busy uh, once that happens. I hope they are prepared for it. I a... don't really think they have an idea what's about to descend on them. People wise, yeah, like... not rocket. Um, but yeah, I feel like everybody probably at that space <laughs> is like, it's, it's, at that space is like, um, I mean, yeah, it's a test launch of a rocket. There would be some some people probably coming over to cover it. I feel like there might be some underestimation how many people are interested in this first flight. Um, also, I don't think there's an ability to even build an infrastructure that quickly if, to support so many people. So it will be it will be a buzzing buzzing time there. It's also spring break, right? Like very close to spring break if time. they go in March. Yes, it just yeah. all all the things. Yes, <laughs> the perfect storm. <laughs> Okay, uh, one, I, uh, we are getting very close now to uh, where we would wrap the show. I want to hit like one or two more questions here. Uh, Metagon asking, any predictions when Starship 24 will go back to the full stack? I, at least I, I, I'm lacking any timeline for that because we have not heard anything about how close to launch that might happen. Uh, any predictions no. here? Yeah, you know, no, I, I, I haven't. I could see... Uh... I, 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 no, but but I would caution you that there's nothing that says it has to be stacked for a, a long period of time before liftoff. And there's also nothing that says they can't stack it relatively close to liftoff either. There's no payload on it. The, the only thing they need to do is connect the upper, uh, essentially, there's more than that. I'm simplifying this, ex, you know, extremely, but like the big thing they have to do is connect the quick disconnect arm to it. So, you know. Just, I think it'll ultimately just come down to the sequencing of the tests and the activities that they're doing and when it makes sense to actually put it on top of the booster. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. So uh, I think it's not a hugely, like a very big watch item right now because we have seen them stacking very fast in the past. It's basically mm -hmm. after rollout, mm -hmm. they can do it in a few hours. Yeah. So. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if like they roll it out a little bit early 
and then stack it closer to launch. Because if you think about it, when they roll these ships, those tiles, sometimes they get a little of a, of a, of a ride on that road because it's not perfect, that road. And sometimes you see cracked tiles. And obviously, you don't you wouldn't want to launch that thing if at least you care about the reentry. You wouldn't want that to to happen, you know. And like, see that crack tile, then stack it, and then launch. So I wouldn't be surprised if that were to happen. That they roll it a, l a little bit early, they inspect that everything is okay, and then stack it and launch. There we go. And I think with that, we are. It's uh, we are on point to uh, we kind of went very really good with the with the timing here for the for the show because we arrived at the at the end of our show and before we wrap I want to make sure to thank some members here because at this point we have a lot of launch directors and flight engineers here you can see but not only those but also our like red team and Capcom uh, thanks to our members you're really making this possible. So uh, yeah, thank to you all and uh, search for your name here on the screen if you're a launch director flight engineer. It's quite a lot and it's quite busy at this point. Thank you so much. And with that, I want to say thank you to Chris Gephardt. Thanks for being on the show, Chris. My pleasure and see you in a few hours for Crew 6. Absolutely. And uh, I also want to thank Alex for being here. Alex, thank you so much for all that amazing SpaceX insight. <laughs> oh boy i hope at least we see more than one launch tomorrow we'll see what happened but definitely look out for for those streams at least the the two from florida we, we're gonna be there uh streaming so do look out for those and also i want to thank mr michael baylor in the background making sure uh, we have all of these amazing uh scenes always ready make sure we look good here presenting so uh thank you michael for being here as well and I have been uh, Adrian Bial for NASA Spaceflight, and we see you all the next time. 10 p.m. Yikes, you bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.